I'm going to speak about the marriage supper of the Lamb this morning. I've gone through all the feasts, and we've seen how all the feasts have um, typified certain events. And uh, four of those feasts have been fulfilled. We have seen that the Feast of Trumpets is still to uh, take place. And the Feast of Trumpets is what will usher in the marriage of the Lamb, because that's when Jesus returns for his bride. And then after the Feast of Trumpets, we saw the Feast of Atonement, the Day of Atonement, which uh, heralds the end of the tribulation, the beginning, beginning of the millennium. And then the Feast of Tabernacles, which is a picture of the thousand years of the Lord coming and tabernacling, tabernacling with his people and living here on earth. Now, there's a parable of the wedding banquet in Matthew 22, and I want to read it to you. Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. Then he sent some more servants and said, Tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fattened cattle have been butchered. Everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his field, another to his business. The rest seized his servants, mistreated them, killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, the wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. So go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, the bad as well as the good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king had come in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. He asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes, friend? And remember, in the Jewish wedding, they used to provide the wedding garment. As you went into the wedding, you would get the wedding gown. The man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited, but few are chosen. Now, if we look at... Uh, the breakdown of this parable. Jesus spoke to them again in parable, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. What is that speaking to us about? The invite went out to the Jews, but they refused to come. And you find that eventually, the invite goes out further. The king was enraged and he sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burnt their city. Now, that had an immediate prophetic uh, relevance because four, dec four decades later, Jerusalem was destroyed and the temple was destroyed. And Jesus um, said, not one stone will be left upon another. And that happened. Titus sent his armies because of the Jewish rebellion. And in AD 70, that took place. But it also had a prophetic fulfillment. Well, it also has a prophetic fulfillment in the time of the tribulation. When God is going to pour out his wrath upon the Jews, because Jesus said, I have come in my father's name and you have not received me. Another will come in his own name and him you will receive. And they're going to accept the Antichrist as their Messiah. And so they're going to bring upon themselves this destruction that is prophesied. And there, were, and there are a number of places in Scripture where prophecies had an immediate fulfillment, but they still had a secondary fulfillment further in the future. The servants went out into the streets, gathered all the people they could find, the bad as well as the good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. So the gospel is taken out to the Gentiles. And we see in Acts chapter 18 where Paul says in verse 6, But when they opposed Paul and became abusive, he shook out his clothes in protest and he said, Your blood be on your own head. 
I am innocent of it. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. And we know that the gospel has gone out to the Gentiles, and millions of Gentiles have responded and have accepted the invite to go to the marriage supper of the Lamb. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man who was not wearing wedding clothes. He asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes, my friend? Tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus has provided the wedding garment. But some people try and get into the wedding festival with their own good works. And it says in Isaiah, our good works are as filthy rags in your sight. We need to have the garment that he has provided. And that is not our good works. That's the one that is handed to us by grace. So the parable of the wedding feast is also a warning to us to make sure we are relying on God's provision of salvation, not on our own good works or religious service. And then it goes on to say in verse 14, for many are invited, but few are chosen. In other words, many people hear the call of God but only a few heed it. Now, if we look at weddings, you know, weddings can be spectacular. A lot of money is spent on trying to, you know, have this perfect moment to join the couple together in marital bliss. The, the bride is dressed in a beautiful white spotless gown and the groom stands up front waiting for her. It's a special moment for that couple and for those who love them and weddings here on earth sometimes are very spectacular sometimes even those spectacular weddings end in divorce not too long afterwards and jesus said this about marriage in heaven because remember they came trying to trick him um, the sadducees because the sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection so they came and they spoke to the Lord about this uh, brother, and he actually had uh, six other brothers. And uh, he was married to this woman, and he dies. And the custom was that the brother, one of the brothers would have to step into the shoes of the deceased and take uh, his wife as, as his own. And they go through the whole story, and this guy, you know, seven of these brothers die, one after the other. And then they said to Jesus, whose wife is she going to be in the resurrection? And Jesus said, you are in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God. At the resurrection, people will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They'll be like the angels in heaven. But there will be a marriage in heaven. We see this clearly laid out in scripture. Most couples are looking for a marriage that will bring them happiness. You've ever heard that phrase, the marriage made in heaven? But unfortunately, it has to be lived out here on earth. So it is far less than perfect. But there's a marriage that will be successful. And it is the eternal marriage, not made between man and woman, but between Jesus Christ himself and the believers who receive him as their savior. Now, if we look at the traditional Jewish marriage, we find out that there's a number of stages and I want to go through these stages because we'll see that they are pertinent to Scripture and to the process that we as the bride of Christ are going through at this particular point in time. First of all, you had the proposal. Okay. And in this proposal, a wedding contract called a ketubah was presented to the intended bride and her father, the young man who wanted to marry this woman would get this contract drawn up and he would present it to the intended bride and to her father. And included in this was a bride price. Okay. So uh, the Jews used to have to pay labola. Okay. Which was appropriate in that society to compensate the young woman's parents for the cost of raising her and also an expression of love for her. Now, Jesus offers in this present age a New Testament or a covenant. He offers a contract. He has offered this ketubah to his bride. So we, just like the Old Testament uh, saints, we are saved 
by faith in God's revealed promises. They looked for faith in this coming Messiah that was promised, but we look back on the finished work at the cross of Calvary, where Jesus paid for the sins of the world. The New Testament isn't a new way to be saved, but it's a new promise in what our salvation would bring, because the offer to us in the new covenant is that we are the bride of Christ. It speaks about the wedding festival, and we'll close off with that scripture, where it, says, it speaks of the patriarchs being there. And Jesus said to the Jews, the, these patriarchs, Abraham and, and Isaac, that you lay claim to, you'll see them there, but you yourselves will not be part of it. So we have been given this promise that we can become the bride of Christ. And we can have a special relationship with him right now. But obviously, going on into eternity. There's no closer relationship here on earth than the relationship between a husband and a wife. Now, this proposal had to be accepted. Okay. And that's why not everybody can be saved. The Lord doesn't force anybody. You, you, you know, in, in certain cultures, you know, in uh, past times, uh, in centuries gone by, uh, the parents used to arrange the marriage, and those that were getting married had no choice in it. But, you know, God has given us a free will, and he doesn't believe in forced and arranged marriages. We have to accept his proposal. Now, to see if the proposal was accepted, the young man would pour a cup of wine for his beloved. Now, remember, Gavin spoke a couple of weeks ago about the four different cups, okay? And we saw how this third cup that Jesus had at the Passover, this represented this cup, which was the proposal. So he had pour a cup of wine for his beloved, and he'd wait to see if she drank it. This cup represents a blood covenant. If she drank the cup, she would have accepted the proposal and they would be betrothed. The young man would then give gifts to his beloved and then he would take his leave. The young woman would then have to wait for him to return to collect her. Now, there would be no wedding if the bride did not respond to the offer of marriage. The young man pouring the cup of wine for his prospective bride clearly symbolizes Jesus' blood that he poured out for our sins. We go to the Lord's Supper to see this truth. Jesus said in Matthew 26, 28, for this is my blood of the New Testament. Okay, Jesus had a New Testament, a new covenant, and he presented this ketubah to his bride which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Luke twenty two twenty says this, Likewise also the cup after supper, saying this cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. So this is the cup that the Lord gives us as a proposal. And when you celebrate communion, what you are doing, you are remembering that you have said yes. You've accepted the proposal. You have said, yes, Lord, I will be your bride. All the bride has to do is accept the proposal of marriage. John 1.12 says, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Now, remember in, one Corinthian, in 2 Corinthians, um, it says in chapter 6, Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. So you see, salvation doesn't end with you receiving Christ. People often say, have you received Jesus? You know, that's supposed to be you got saved. It's not just about you receiving Jesus. It's about Jesus receiving you. And I mean, in this betrothal, the only thing that could end in divorce, could end this betrothal in divorce, because that betrothal we'll see was a commitment of marriage. 
you actually had to be divorced if you were betrothed. It isn't like our engagements nowadays, which almost like are just, just a little bit more serious than going out. That was a commitment. But if the bridegroom found that his bride had been unfaithful, he could divorce her. He could end that. So Jesus said, come out from among them and be separate and do not touch the unclean thing and I will receive you. When a person by faith accepts Jesus Christ as their savior, it's a picture of the bride accepting the proposal of the bridegroom. Now, one day James writes to the Jewish believers in the book of James, and he calls them adulteresses. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously? Jesus is jealous over his bride. He wants us for himself. He does not want to share us with the world. We have accepted his marriage proposal. Now, the bridegroom must have the approval of his father prior to proposing. This being his father's house, the father was the one who would say when the wedding chamber was ready and when the marriage might take place. If someone would ask the bridegroom when the day of the wedding was, he would reply, only father knows. Quite amazing to see how many parallels there are. We saw when we did the Feast of Pentecost that the bridegroom and the bride, after, they have, uh, after the contract has been accepted, he would give his bride gifts. The father and the bridegroom would give gifts to the bride, called a matan. That, that, was, that was the name that was the gift from the son. And the father would give her gifts as well, called a shaluhim. These gifts sustained his bride during their separation till their wedding day. The gift given by Jesus and the father was the gift of the Holy Spirit to sustain us until Jesus returns for his bride. This was initially fulfilled at Pentecost. And the bride of Christ now eagerly awaits the return of the bridegroom. Galatians 3, verse 22, because the bride promises, he says, I will come back for you. But scripture has locked up everything under the control of sin, so that what was promised, being given through faith in Jesus Christ, might be given to those who believe. So the bridegroom has made a promise. As in the Jewish wedding, the bridegroom leaves to prepare a new home for his bride. So our bridegroom goes to prepare a new home for his bride. He promises to come again and receive her to himself, that where the bridegroom is, so will be the bride. And we know that passage of scripture so well. John 14, 1 to 3, let not your hearts be troubled, Jesus said to his disciples. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And Jesus sealed his promise to his bride. Writing to the Ephesians, Paul tells them of the promised inheritance that we have. And he goes on to say that we are sealed. Ephesians 1, 13 to 14. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit, guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. So Jesus Christ 
The bridegroom has offered to us a covenant, a proposal of salvation, but we will see that that proposal is conditional to the purity of the bride, as I've mentioned. Now, I looked at a couple of Jewish web websites, but this is from Wikipedia. Erison is the Hebrew term for betrothal. In modern Hebrew, Erison means engagement, but this is not the historical meaning of the term, which is the first part of marriage. So betrothal in the time of Jesus didn't mean what we mean when we talk about engaged. It's actually part of the marriage ceremony. The betrothal was binding and could only be undone by divorce with proper grounds, such as the bride being found not to be pure. And the example of Joseph and Mary is the typical example there. Now, this is from this website, uh, website this Jewish website, My Jewish Learning. Until late in the Middle Ages, marriage consisted of two ceremonies. They were marked by celebrations at two separate times with an interval in between. First came the betrothal, Erison, and later the wedding, Nisun. At the betrothal, the woman was legally married, although she remained in her father's house. So folks, we are the bride of Christ. We are betrothed to him. And we'll see in scripture, we'll see that borne out in what Paul writes to the Corinthian church. She could not belong to another man unless she was divorced from her betrothed. The wedding meant only that the betrothed woman, accompanied by a colorful procession, was brought from her father's house to the house of her groom, and the legal tie with him was consummated. The proposal of marriage is made to the father. The bride accepts the proposal. And officially, the couple is betrothed. The bride is now sanctified, which means set apart to her husband. The only way to break the covenant was divorce. And the only grounds for divorce was that the bride had deceived the bridegroom and was not pure. We see that example in Joseph and Mary. He wanted to put her away when he found out that she was pregnant. In Matthew 119, then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make a public, her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. He just wanted to privately divorce her because he thought it was uh, infidelity. But the angel came and told him that what Mary had in her womb was a conception by the Holy Spirit. Yet in the marriage of the believer to Jesus Christ, there can be no impurity. It is completely removed by Jesus Christ. When we put our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. And we are clothed in his righteousness. And we have the washing of the word. Remember in Ephesians 5, it says, he washes us with the washing of the word, that he may present us to himself, a bride without spot, without blemish. Now, betrothal pictures salvation. Like the Jewish marriage custom, the betrothal begins with a contract presented by the bridegroom. Jesus Christ is the bridegroom. He presents to all men, all men his contract of salvation, and he's paid the price on the cross of Calvary. The bride price has been paid. All that is necessary is for the bride to accept the proposal. The price for redemption was his sacrifice on the cross. 1 John 2.2, 2, he is the propitiation, which means the full payment for our sins. Not for ours only, but for all the sins of the world. Remember we saw, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. So this covenant was not the only one, uh, was not the one he made with Israel. This was a new covenant. This was the covenant that was made to those of us who become part of the church, the bride of Christ. And Hebrews 8 explains this covenant. It says, but in fact, the ministry Jesus has received is as superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is mediator is superior 
to the old one, since the new covenant is established on better promises. Jesus gave us a better covenant with better promises. To Israel, God promised the coming of the Messiah and the Messiah's kingdom, where Israel would be at peace and prosper. And we see that the land promises are going to come to fulfillment during the time of the millennium. He promised them that they would finally have the land that he gave to Abraham that extends from the Nile River in the south to the Euphrates in the north. Israel has never, ever had that land. If you look at scripture, Gavin has mentioned this before. The land that was promised to Israel has never fully been theirs. Just in 1948, they got back a portion of it. To the believers, however, Jesus has promised something much better. The gospel is God's proclamation of this new covenant. Jesus further revealed this new covenant, this New Testament, when he gave us the Lord's Supper. 1 Corinthians 11.25, after the same manner, he also took the cup when he had supped, saying, this is the New Testament in my blood. This do as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. Isn't that wonderful to know that every time we are partaking of the Lord's Supper as we are having communion, we are remembering that we have got a husband that we have promised ourselves to and we are keeping ourselves set apart for. Satan's not going to just stand back and do nothing. He will try and ruin God's plan for us to be the bride of Christ. And so Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 11, 1, 2, 3, I hope you will put up with me in a little foolishness. Yes, please put up with me. I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. I promised you to one husband, to Christ, so that I may present you as a pure virgin to him. But I'm afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Gavin has ministered a lot along these lines of Calvinism and once saved, always saved, etc., etc. The Bible doesn't warn us against things that couldn't happen. It would be a waste of time to fill up the pages proposing something that was impossible. It is possible for the bride of Christ to be deceived and to be lured away from being part of that ultimate ceremony which is going to take place in heaven, the second part of the marriage. I'm afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes to you and preaches a Jesus, other than the Jesus we preached, or if you receive a different spirit from the spirit you received, or a different gospel. And we live in a day and age today where there are different gospels going out. You put up with it easy enough. For such people are false apostles, deceitful workers, masquerading as apostles of Christ. And no wonder for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It is not surprising then if his servants also masquerade as servants of righteousness. And so we've got these false apostles preaching a false gospel, trying to lure us away from our betrothal to the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul goes on to say, if anyone else comes and preaches another gospel, let him be accursed. Now then, the next phase of the wedding is when the bridegroom returns for his bride. And we're looking forward to that one. When the wedding chamber was ready, the bridegroom could go and collect his bride. He could do this at any time. So the bride would make special arrangements. It was the custom for the bride to keep a lamp, her veil, and do other things beside her bed. Her bridesmaid were, bridesmaids were also in waiting and had to have oil ready for the lamps. When the bridegroom and his friends got close to the bride's house, they would give a loud shout 
and blow the shafur, the shafar. We heard that uh, last week when Jews for Jesus was here, the ram's horn, to let her know and to be ready. At the proper time appointed by the bridegroom's father, a messenger would be sent to announce the bridegroom's coming and the bridegroom taking his wife. The bride, not knowing when the bridegroom would come, was to keep herself ready at all times. And this is what comes out in Matthew 25 in the parable of the five foolish and the five wise virgins. Jesus gave the parable of the ten virgins who were called to the marriage supper. These virgins, when they heard the bridegroom was coming, would go out and meet him and light their lamps, light the way with their lamps. The groom, best man and other male escorts, would leave the groom's father's house and conduct a torchlight procession to the home of the bride. The groom's arrival would be preceded by a shout. This shout would forewarn the bride to be prepared for the coming bridegroom. What does it say in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13 to 18? For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive will be, and are left will be caught up together with them in clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So Jesus doesn't come down to earth as he does when he comes down after the tribulation period and his feet touch the Mount of Olives. We rise to meet him in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. So we're waiting for that. We call that occasion the rapture. Now the hupa, also commonly spelled chupa, is a symbol of God's presence at the wedding. So you know these wedding canopies? That has got a significance. It's a symbol of God's presence at the wedding and in the home being established under the canopy. It symbolizes the new home to which the bridegroom will take the bride. Before leaving, the young man would announce, I'm going to prepare a place for you. I will return for you when I'm ready. The usual practice was for the young man to return to his father's house and build a honeymoon room there. This is what is symbolized by the chupa or the canopy, which is characteristic of Jewish weddings. He was not allowed to skimp on the work and had to get his father's approval before he could consider it ready for his bride. If asked the date of his wedding, he would reply, remember, only my father knows. And we saw that. I go to prepare a place for you. That is the wedding chamber, and that's what's symbolized by the chupa. Typically, it would be about a year before he would return for his bride. Meanwhile, the bride would be making herself ready so that she would be pure and beautiful for her bridegroom. During this time, she would wear a veil when she went out to show that she was spoken for. She had been bought with a price. So an unknown day and an unknown hour. In Matthew 24, Jesus speaks about this, about the day or the hour. No one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Now remember, Jesus is God. Jesus is part of the Godhead. But when he came down in his incarnation, when he came down as a man, he lay aside his deity. So when people point to you, point to the limitations of Jesus when he was here on earth, why didn't he know about the coming? Well, it's because he had lay aside, laid aside his divine power, his divine knowledge. And not only that, he even said, I can do nothing of myself. He said, only what the Father does, I can do. Jesus was limited here on earth to do only what he could do in the power of the Holy Spirit. That's why he resisted the temptation to turn the stones into bread, because that wasn't the Lord's will. If he did that, he would have been drawing on his power as part of the triune God. That's why in Gethsemane, when Peter cut off Malchus's ear, he said, put your sword away. Don't you think I could call on my father and he would send 10 legions of angels? But how would the scriptures be fulfilled? So Jesus, in his humanity, 
subjected himself to the will of the Father. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying, giving in marriage. Up to the day Noah entered the ark, they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood took them all away. This is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding with a handmill. One will be taken, the other left. Now, this is very different to what we see after the tribulation. After the tribulation, you see the Lord sends out his angels to get the wicked and to separate the wicked. Okay. But here, the righteous are taken. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken, the other left. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know the day the Lord will come. Once the bridegroom arrived, the wedding ceremony would take place and the bride and the bridegroom would spend their honeymoon night together in the home provided by the bridegroom. The bride would be adorned in her wedding garments. Shortly after the arrival, the bride and the groom would be escorted by other members of the wedding party to the bridal chamber or the chupa. Prior to entering the chamber, the bride remained veiled so that no one could see her face. While the groom's men and bridesmaid would have to wait outside, the bride and groom would enter the bridal chamber alone. Following the marriage, there would be a seven-day feast, a marriage feast. Revelation 19, 5-9 says, Then our, a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all his servants, and those who fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters, and as the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. For the fine linen are the acts, the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, write, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. So when the wedding party arrived at the father's house, the newlyweds went into the wedding chamber. The groom's best friend uh, and uh, stood outside waiting for the groom to tell him that the marriage had been consummated. When the couple emerged, there would be much congratulation and the marriage supper would begin. Then all the friends really started celebrating for seven days that the couple were honeymooning. Now, where do these seven days come from? If you look at Jacob, when he worked for seven years for Laban, the agreement was that he would get Rachel. And Gavin has shared with us recently how he was deceived by Laban, somebody who was a, a better deceiver than he was. And uh, he ended up spending the honeymoon night with Leah. And so he's very upset. So Jacob said to Laban, give me my wife. My time is completed and I want to make love to her. So Laban brought together all the people of the place and gave a feast. But what happens is he finds out now he slept with the wrong woman and he's been deceived. So he confronts Laban. Laban says, it is not our custom here to give the younger daughter in marriage before the older one. He unfortunately didn't give him that information in the beginning. Finish this daughter's bridal week. So notice there's a bridal week. Finish this daughter's bridal week and we will give you the younger one also in return for seven years of work. So he still had to work another seven years. In Judges 14, we see another marriage. And this is the marriage between Samson and Timnah. Not something that lasted very long, okay? Because uh, this woman deceived Samson, okay? It says here, now his father went down to see the woman. This is Samson's father. And there Samson held a feast, as was customary, for young men. When the people saw him, they chose 30 men to be his companions. And Samson gives them this riddle. 
Samson said to them, if you can answer me within seven days of the feast, notice within the seven days of the feast, the feast was seven days long, I will give you 30 linen garments and 30 sets of clothes. And you remember how um, he was deceived because his wife or his proposed wife was told by these 30 guys that she better find out what the riddle means. And so she finally on the seventh day gets it out of Samson and, he tell, and she tells these guys. Now, it says this from the free mess messianic Bible. Although in ancient times the wedding feast, Suda, after the Nisuim, that's the marriage, might have included seven full days of food, music, dancing, and celebration. Today, the Jewish ceremony is usually followed by a wedding supper and a reception with food, wine, and music. So modern-day Jews do not keep this same tradition. However, Orthodox Jews celebrate after the wedding for seven nights with friends and family, hosting festive meals in honor of the bride and groom. So the Orthodox view, uh, Jews still keep to this practice. Now, it's interesting to note that seven days, and how long is the bride of Christ in heaven while the tribulation period is carrying on? Seven years. So it's very possible. Some people believe that the marriage, marriage supper of the Lamb is going to happen during that seven-year period. It would seem that it fits the type. Now, John the Baptist refers to himself as the friend of the bridegroom. He doesn't refer to himself as part of the bride. Remember, John the Baptist died before Jesus established the new covenant. So he would have fallen under the old covenant. John 3, verse 22 to 30, an argument developed between some of John's disciples and a certain Jew over the matter of ceremonial washing. They came to John and said to him, Rabbi, that man who was with you on the other side of the Jordan, the one you testified about, he's baptizing and everyone is going to him. To this, John replied, a person can only receive what is given to them from heaven. You yourselves can testify that I said, I am not the Messiah, but am sent ahead of him. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him. And it is full of joy when he and he is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine and is now complete. He must become greater. I must become least. The friend of the bridegroom. Relationship is what gets you into the marriage feast, not religion. In Luke 13, 22 to 30, someone asked him, Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? He said to them, make every effort to enter through the narrow door, because many, I tell you, will try to enter, but will not be able to. Once the owner of the house gets up and closes the door, you will stand outside knocking and pleading, sir, open the door for us. But he will answer, I don't know you or where you come from. And you will say, we ate and drank with you. You taught in our streets. But he will reply, I don't know you. And people will say, we went to church. We listened to the ministry. And Jesus will say, but you don't have a relationship with me. I don't know you. I don't know you or where you come from, away from me, all you evil doers. There will be nash, nash, weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves thrown out. So the kingdom of God, which is reference to the millennium, there will be Jews, but those that have been partakers of the first and the second covenant. The first covenant, obviously, you're going to have those who survived the massacre and the annihilation of the Antichrist. And you're going to have Jews who, like us, have accepted Jesus Christ as Savior and are part of the bride of Christ. 
people will come from the east and the west and the north and the south and will take their places at the feast in the kingdom of God. Indeed, there are those who are last who will be first and those who are first who will be last. So, folks, there's a marriage and you're invited. Some of you have accepted the invitation. I trust that you all have. And that those of you who haven't will avail yourself of the opportunity because we still are in the day of grace. Let's just bow our heads in prayer.